our program. You can meet our panelists or meet us down at the Dada Bar for more conversation. So we will be engaging with you with questions, short questions. Testing one, two. Okay, good evening, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street, San Francisco. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our program, Think and Drink, and tonight's topic, Trump's Impact on the Bay Area, Californians, and Federal Policies. Our program tonight is moderated by Kim May Cutler, with journalist Josh Harkinson, Liam Dillon, Joe Eskenazi, and Darwin Bond-Graham. And we're very pleased to welcome you all tonight. Now, for those of you who are new to the Mechanics Institute, we'd like to invite you to come on Wednesday at noon and take a free tour of our library and our beautiful Beaux-Arts building. Also, consider becoming a member and attend most of our programs for free. The Mechanics Institute continues to be one of the most vital cultural and literary centers in the Bay Area with ongoing author events, panels, our cinema lit film series on Friday nights, book clubs, computer classes, writers groups, chess classes and tournaments and more. So whether you're coming here to read, play chess, engage or work, I think we have something for you all under one roof. Also. Just FYI, we have fiber optic speed internet. Pretty good. Also, you can see all of our listings of events on our website at milibrary.org. And one other idea, if you'd like to join us at the Dada Bar, which is in our retail space on the first floor, please do so, and members receive a 10% discount on drinks. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Kim May Cutler. Kim is a third generation San Franciscan. A resident. Oh, San Francisco Bay Arian. <laughs> San Francisco Bay Arian, who has spent several years working as a technology journalist and has been published in places like TechCrunch, San Francisco Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and Bloomberg. She recently joined an early stage venture firm, Initialized Capital, and serves on the city's local homeless coordinating board. So please welcome Kim and our panelists. Well, um, I, I kind of first came up with the idea of this. I think it was like after inauguration day, and I was just like, this, there's this total feeling. Panelists, please turn on your microphones. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and it was, I had this kind of surreal feeling overtaking me, and I just wanted to understand later on into the administration, like what were going to be the real kind of practical on the ground effects of the Trump administration on local and state government. And so I reached out to a lot of reporters whose work I read all the time and who I really respect. Um, uh, Darwin's from the East Bay Express. He's done some really exceptional work on covering the Oakland Police Department and um, some really great recent coverage on um, immigration courts and deportations. Jay Eskenazi, he's been covering San Francisco government for I, I don't even know how many. Uh, <laughs> a long time. A long time. And then uh, Liam is up in the Capitol for um, the Los Angeles Times. And then we have Josh, who has covered environmental policy. And you've spent the last year kind of studying the alt-right for Mother Jones. And so I just thought, you know, I love people who have, you know, all, all the on the ground coverage who are like going to all the like really long meetings that, you know, we don't necessarily have the time, and everyone here doesn't necessarily have the time to do, and who know all the kinds of dynamics of all the traditional players um, in the level of government that they cover. And so we've got Sacramento, we've got San Francisco, we've got Oakland, and then we've also got um, Josh looking at, at some of the kind of congressional effects. So I just kind of want to start and open it up to just a couple first um, initial thoughts. Like, what, what, when you look at the level of government that you've covered for the last several years, are things, how are things different, or how are things the same? And maybe, I'll, maybe we'll start with Joe. Uh, how much time do you want me to take? Because I, <laughs> I, I, think, I think if I speak at like Gilbert and Sullivan speed, I can get this done in five minutes and give you a, a good preamble of 
politics and government, which are different. And then yeah. kind of, and then kind of a uh, five, five minutes overview. is fine. And I'm then gonna, if you, I'm going to go really fast, and like, and this of course entitles everyone else to take five minutes, and, <laughs> and hopefully that's <laughs> that's hopefully that's that's stimulating. Uh, so so when you called, I hadn't, I I had been away from City Hall for a while, and I hadn't I hadn't I I was, had fallen behind. So I I interviewed a lot of people, but essentially, uh, I feel like you know if anyone who studied World War II knows the period between September of 1939 and May 10th, 1940. Uh, Winston Churchill called it the Twilight War. Uh, it was uh, humorously called uh, Sitzkrieg. The French called it Drôle de Guerre, which is the strange war, funny war. Uh, what's notable is that it ended very abruptly on May 11th, 1940, when war began. And uh, right now we're in the Drôle de Guerre in San Francisco. Uh, there is certainly politics going on. Uh, governmentally, everyone's kind of preparing for what might happen. Now, there's a huge caveat to that, and that is if you are a powerless person, if you are uh, an undocumented person, if you are uh, a marginal person in society, uh, these aren't theoretical effects and you are already feeling it. And I'm going to defer largely to Darwin on immigration because he's done spectacular work, but I'll just go right to that and say that uh, many of you thought that we would get crushed right away uh, because of the vindictive nature of the Trump government. and uh, And City officials I talked to were worried that ICE would raid the Chinese New Year's parade. That didn't happen. However, there are things happening. Uh, immigration attorneys tell me that there have been uh, unsubtle changes in policies regarding prosecutorial discretion in amnesty cases. If you have a 16-year-old unaccompanied minor and he comes across the border, uh, you can say, we want to try for amnesty. And usually, beforehand, the prosecuting attorneys would say, OK. Now, to a fault, they say no, they challenge it. So far, the judges tend to rule uh, in favor of the immigration attorneys. However, as many of you have seen, uh, new judges are being sent here. Uh, immigration attorneys I talked to say that certainly the implication is, is that these judges are being sent. Uh, they are not going to be as open-minded as some of the judges in San Francisco now. And uh, this is to expedite deportations. Of course, that hasn't happened yet. But the effects so far have been very real. Uh, attorneys tell me that their clients go to work, come home, and don't leave the house. That's what's happening. Uh, the good news I have for you is that uh, the city feels very confident in its case against the executive order uh, from uh, the Trump administration, which legal minds in the city have described in one word as poor in terms of the lawyership involved. Uh, April 12th, a week from today, is when we have our day in court. Uh, however, there are a few things coming up. Uh, in mid-May, we're going to have the first bond issuance in the city, and if bond in issuers feel that the city is at risk of being dinged, uh, they will raise our interest rates, and that means more money goes to interest and less money goes to things the city wants to spend on. And also by mid-May, the mayor is going to have to decide on how much money to set aside in reserves in case we get lots of money taken away from us, and uh, this sets up some very difficult decisions. Uh, if you don't put uh, enough money in the reserves, you will be high and dry, if bad things happen, if you put too much, uh, you run a multiple risk of, of not funding the city and also uh, of sending the state the message that you have more money than, than, than you know what to do with and you won't get any from them. Just a short question, mm -hmm. because the sanctuary city's risk, I mean, that is in total about a billion dollars of risk to this particular city government. It is $1.2 billion in recurring funds. It's $800 million in one-time funds for things like the central subway and, and Doyle Drive and things like that. And to make things, uh, to, to, put, to put in perspective how nasty this could be, we're being reimbursed later by the feds ostensibly for money that we've already spent. Did my mic just go out? Okay. So we're already spending the money. At issue is whether or not they're going to pay us for it. So we're already spending the money. And it's, it's very clearly in Dennis Herrera's letter that, you know, we are not sure if we're going to get it. Uh, now, certainly the human drama of immigration is, is worth all the attention it's getting. However, the real money money that we stood to lose was medical from ACA. That is 92% of the money that we stood to lose of the 1.2 billion is uh, tied up in uh, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, TANF, Temporary Assistance Needy Families, and SNAP uh, food stamps. So these are not well-off people who are, you know, these are, these are the people who really need money are going to be victimized. To put in perspective how big a bullet we temporarily dodged, 14% of San Franciscans gained health care through the ACA. You're talking about well over 130,000 people. And what's more, uh, this would have affected every provider in the city. The ripple effect would have been huge. So certainly, health care can be undermined from the inside without them just cutting it off. But uh, that was a very, very big bullet that we dodged. Uh, as far as the money that we've saved up and for a rainy day, it really is for a rainy day. 
When I talk to people in, in the bean counting offices in the city, they say that these amount of, this amount of money is, quote, not in contemplation of losing a significant amount of federal money. Uh, they're already underfunded as it is, and they are there uh, in the event of a recession. And uh, as far as pitting whether we're going to have a recession or not, the city's financial experts say it is an almost historical certainty. Uh, what's more, when I asked what plan do you have in case we lose $1.2 billion, the answer was, I know folks find it hard to believe, but we don't have one. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to paralyze yourself with what to do if you lose $1.2 billion of your budget. So if you can't swim, there's a great objective in not falling off the boat. And that's, uh, that's what we're going to do on that. Now, we shift from government to politics. These are two very different things. Politically, it, there was talk of unity and, you know, um, almost like a Prince Hal moment where, you know, uh, the young wastrel Prince Hal becomes King Henry V and it's more nobility. Well, that's bullshit. <laughs> Trump is a cudgel that can be used to beat people into thinking what you want them to think. And that comes on both the, the progressive side and the moderate side. You saw incredibly sharp elbows over um, the Jeff Adachi, uh defense measure. We can go into that. Uh, the inclusionary housing uh, debate now is every bit as political as you'd expect. And it's absolutely tempered by the fact that many of the principals involved are running for mayor next year. Don't forget, we're going to elect the mayor next year, we're going to elect the governor next year. So this is a big deal. Now let's get to the overall, which ties into, I'm very interested in what you have to say, because some of it has to do in the state. When I talk to politicos here in the city, they say, they point out that Alex Padilla recently released a report that says far from flatlining to zero, which is normal after a presidential election, registration, voter registration is continuing. And and that is, that is not normal. And what's more, uh, a consultant that I spoke with had just finished the statewide poll, and this, you'll be interested in these results, I think. They went from the voter ID registration, so they knew what party people were in, and they asked them as if they didn't know, what party are you in? They got the identical amount of Democrats they thought they would. The GOP was lower. So people were, were failing to say they were in the GOP. They were either ashamed or they didn't want to talk about it. Uh, what this means is that many of the 2018 seats could well be in play. It could mean that at least on a statewide level, uh, there'll be even more democratic hegemony. Uh, a couple things to take away, and then I'll, I'll cede the floor. It's been my time. Something <laughs> to keep in mind. A lot of Trump's just utter odiousness, his comic villainy, uh, obscures from the fact that many of the things that are coming down upon us as a, as a liberal city, and all, many, most cities are, 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 are liberal, are things that any Republican would do. And they're things that the Republicans have been planning to do for a long time. So we wouldn't be having an immigration effect like this, but much of the other things would be happening regardless, uh, whether it was President Kasich, President Cruz, President Rubio, et cetera. People are appalled at uh, the defunding of HUD, but Jerry Brown defunded redevelopment. Uh, the, the opportunities to build affordable housing have been greatly curtailed in recent years. Finally, uh, beings have already uh, broken ground on, uh, on profanity. Uh, a well-ranking city official uh, assured me that San Francisco is in a unique position to be fucked uh, with regards <laughs> to uh, defunding because we are a city county, and that means that you're going to take the full brunt when you lose Medicare funds, Medicaid funds, things like that, uh, as opposed to places where it would be spread around through many different municipalities. Uh, this could mean that the G G Geary BRT is never going to be built. It could mean that when the Transbay Terminal opens up uh, with an immediate operating deficit, the feds are not going to help us out. But let's again focus on the poorest and the most desperate who are going to suffer the most, already going to suffer the most, and perhaps almost fittingly, uh, the effect of the Trump administration is going to be to exacerbate uh, the hallmark this city already has of being the most bifurcated place in all the United States, uh, where you can buy your way out of the misery. Uh, but if you're not doing well, you're going to feel it very much indeed. So that's <laughs> So with that, Darwin, no pressure at all. <laughs> what do you want to know? Um, I mean, I, I mean I'm, as, as someone who's lived in San Francisco for a long time, I'm more familiar with how the, all the different factions work. But I'm curious, like, when you're wa watching um, Oakland, Oakland's mayor and city council grapple with, with some of the same possible facts, the loss of sanctuary city funding, um, what, what has changed and what hasn't changed? Um, I think there's a lot of actual uh, grandstanding in the East Bay. Um, I think a lot of the politicians there see Trump as free points to score with their constituency. Um, so everybody from the you know Richmond City Council and Mayor to Oakland to San Leandro and, and beyond, they're all 
trying to pass legislation right now against Trump, come out with these statements against Trump, against Trump's immigration policies. I don't know that there's a lot to it, substantively. But do you know if they're, I mean, making the same, not plans, because it's really hard to grapple with that level of risk, but I mean, what, the sanctuary city risk to Oakland is something like, is it, was it 300? It's a couple hundred million dollars, right? It's, uh, it's, it's tens of millions. Okay. Um, it would be like a, a hundreds of millions over the next decade or so. Yeah. And yeah, there is money. There is money at risk in Oakland, and that's a pretty big deal. Um, my understanding of it, though, is that from you know lawyers who are looking at this stuff, is that the actual likelihood of losing all that money is really low because there has to be a nexus between the federal money that's coming into the city and the way that the city is supposedly disobeying the federal government's orders. So if the city or the county is saying we're not going to participate in immigration enforcement and the federal government says, well, we're going to take your health care money away. Um, from what I read and hear, it, 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 that might not stand up in court. It fails the germaneness test. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, I think in, and I think in the East Bay, a lot of the um, elected officials there understand that. And... But I, what I see is just a lot of, um, I mean, I follow a lot of city council members on Facebook, and I see a lot of long Facebook rants about Trump. And as, as, they're, you know, as they should be concerned, um, because Trump's going to do a lot of horrible things to their constituency, but at the same time, there is a, there's an extent to which some of that is just gaining a lot of free points by saying something quite easy that everyone's going to agree with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's turn to Sacramento. <laughs> um, what are the, uh, what are the, you know, when I've talked to friends who are working in, in the Capitol, I mean, they've said, I mean, at least initially before HCA fell apart, like they, the legislature really oriented around creating fast tracks on the two highest priorities for California, which are immigration and healthcare. Um, so what, what have you seen change at the, at the state level? Right. So really up until this past week, it was almost entirely dominated by Trump. Every conversation was about Trump in one way or the other. There was a resolution literally almost every day in either the Senate or the Assembly that was denouncing some aspect of Trump. And it was in a lot of ways crowding out any other discussion that we might be having. The only thing that's broken through is this, this past week, uh, and the fact there might be a vote tomorrow on increasing the gas tax um, to pay for transportation repairs that's been on, on the docket for a number of years. But aside from that, everything has been Trump related. And it's really fallen into four different categories. You mentioned immigration. I think there's been the most action on that. Um, there are, I just counted, uh, at least a half dozen bills that have been introduced that try to get at some of the Im immigration aspects in one way or the other. The most prominent uh, passed the Senate this week. Uh, it's uh, now on the docket for the Assembly. It's Senate Bill 54. This is from the Senate leader, Kevin DeLeon, from Los Angeles, which aims to make the whole state a sanctuary state. Um, so that would uh, allow or uh, not allow uh, any state or local, including down to school police, uh, to participate in immigration actions in any way or use state resources to detain anyone for immigration actions. And so, again, a ton of bills on, uh, on immigration. I can go into, uh, into them more later if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, healthcare, there's been a lot of wait and see. Um, you know, the numbers there are so daunting. Uh, at one point, they were talking about a $24 billion hit to the state budget, which is just astronomical and almost impossible to plan for, and that was why the governor said, well, we shouldn't even plan for this, um, because we wouldn't even know what to do, right? Um, so uh, when the healthcare, GOP healthcare bureau that failed is working its way through, the number was six billion, and, and then that would uh, increase over time. Um, so that was the estimate that the governor had put out. But there's been no action really there, because again, it's a bit of a wait and see, and it's tough to understand exactly what you need to do until the details are actually released. The third area is uh, climate change. Uh, there is a lot of back and forth over that. Um, I think the most prominent issue is the state has a waiver from the Clean Air Act to allow it to uh, adopt stricter vehicle emission standards than the 
rest of the country. Um, and uh, sort of most, I guess, alarmingly to folks here, it was during uh, Scott Pruitt's confirmation hearing, our new senator, Kamala Harris, asked him if he would continue that waiver, which has, generally speaking, been a bipartisan thing um, for a very long time. And he said, ah, I've got to think about that. And so that raised a ton of alarm in the state. Um, and so the exact details of what that might do um, could be catastrophic to the state's climate change goals. Um, but in the short term, at least, most folks believe that it would be very difficult for the federal government to actually remove the waiver that the state already has uh, going forward. If the state wants to meet its, again, very ambitious climate goals in 2030 and 2050, we probably will need to have a renewal. And then the last thing is, uh, again, like I said at the beginning, is and echoing Darwin, is just bluster. I mean, every day, every single statement, it's a legislator trying to one-up each other in my inbox about how much they hate this thing that Donald Trump did today. And because they want, they want their quote in the story that I write or my colleagues write or someone writes, them to be the person that's against uh, Donald Trump, right? And so, um, you know, there are a lot of bills, a bill that would, you know, um, not allow someone to be on the state ballot for president if they don't release their tax returns, or a bill that um, would put the border wall to a public vote in the state, right? Um, none of these things have really any practical effect or impact, um, but it certainly makes the lawmakers feel good and their supporters feel good in raising them. Mm -hmm. um, Josh, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to answer for all of fed, the federal level, because that's way too complicated, but in some of the areas that you cover, like uh, climate policy, um, you know, what, are, what are the changes that you've seen and what you cover and how you know, different elected leaders and then interest groups work together since the Trump, Trump uh, has been, um, came into power? Yeah, um, you know, I don't, I actually, I used to cover climate a lot more than I do now, but, you know, I think to just sort of put a, a, another layer on top of what these guys have been saying, I mean, what you're seeing uh, on the, the local, state, and national level is that Democrats love to criticize Trump. Why? Because Trump unifies them, and that is a lesson that was learned by the Tea Party and was why it was so successful, because everybody hated Obama, and... So there are, you know, lots of divisions on the left and on the right. You know, the Democratic Party is, is riven by, uh, you know, the schism between the Clinton and Sanders camps. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of hard feelings there. And so criticizing Trump is a way uh, to sort of ignore that or overcome that. Um, and so I think that uh, by doing that, uh, politicians are, are trying to sort of, you know, unite their base. And, and in a sense, it's a cop-out, but it also has been proven to be an effective strategy. Um, so, you know, in terms of national action, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how well united Democrats are. Uh, and, you know, here's an issue that relates to California. Look at infrastructure. I mean, California is voting tomorrow on this infrastructure plan by, by Jerry Brown's uh, gas tax, you know, which would be the largest increase in state history of the gas tax. Um, you know, it funds very much needed uh, infrastructure in the state. Um, it's been long neglected. It mirrors the proposal uh, by the House Minority Leader in, on the Transportation Committee in Washington, who also has a gas tax plan um, to basically uh, fund the infrastructure that, that Trump and Democrats agree is necessary. Uh, the Republicans, though, led by, by Ryan, uh, Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, and uh, you know, the, uh, a certain faction within the Trump administration headed by um, the Commerce Secretary, the, the billionaire, so, whoever his name is, um, uh, they would instead, um, you know, use tax incentives, um, which are highly problematic and would basically be a way, to, I mean, it would only work to fund something like a toll road where you have a revenue generating project and a private developer could get, uh, you know, tax breaks off of the profits they would make. So, you know, it's not, it's not workable. But the problem is that Democrats aren't united um, enough to, to pass uh, Brown's plan. It, it's, it seems likely that it's going to fail. It may or may not fail tomorrow. It's, it's very much, you know, I mean, California has a two-thirds threshold for passing tax increases, is, so it's very challenging. This is the genuine, this is the, what you were telling me, this was the real test of, you know, the first time that the Democrats have the supermajority in the state yeah. and what that actually means. Right. It's a test of Democratic Party unity. And on some level, if Democrats can't pull it off here in California, then you know, how are Democrats in Washington going to have a united front against um, the Republican approach? Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that there is an interrelationship between California politics and national politics that we haven't seen in a very long time. I mean, the rest of the country is looking to California to lead on so many issues, um, you know, whether it's immigration, climate, 
um, you, know, you, you know, economic justice, you name it. Um, and so, uh, you know, Brown is sort of, you know, looked to as a hero nationally, but he also has a lot of weight on his shoulders right now to perform. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring it back to um, what is probably California's primary issue, which is immigration. Um, Darwin, you spent, what is it, several weeks in hearings, it's a long right? Time. Months? Yeah. Or was it weeks or months? It was, it was weeks. It but, was weeks. I mean, it was over many months, you know? Yeah. yeah. So what, what, what was that? Like, what did you learn that you didn't expect to see in the court proceedings? And talk a little bit about how the rights in that system are fundamentally different from other parts of the justice system. Can I, can I zoom out first yeah. and talk yes, about... Yes, um, so there's So there's a, the way that deportations happen, right? There's this agency called Immigration and Customs Enforcement. It's in the Department of Homeland Security. And deportation officers go out and find people who are illegally um, or un unlawfully present in the United States, right? They may have come into the United States legally. They are not citizens. And then their um, legal status to be here um, expires at some point. Deportation officers go out, find those people, issue a notice to appear to take them to immigration court. Um, but the main, the main interface, actually, uh, by which the deportation officers find these people is local law enforcement. In the Bay Area, um, there's a lot of entanglement, actually, between local law enforcement and um, ICE, even, even though we consider ourselves uh, these sanctuary jurisdictions. Um, the, here's some of the ways that local law enforcement are entangled and end up feeding uh, the federal government these people into the immigration court. So you have um, every county jail uh, in the Bay Area, right, is run by the sheriff's department. And when a person is arrested and booked into jail, their fingerprints are taken. Their fingerprints then go instantly into a federal database that's run by the FBI. The FBI then instantly shares the person's fingerprints with ICE. ICE then runs the fingerprints in their biometric database, which is giant. And they can tell if that person is or is not a U.S. citizen. And then based on that, they'll um, narrow down the number of people who are arrested in any given day. Mind you, just arrested. Being arrested doesn't mean you're a bad person. doesn't even mean you did anything wrong. You just got arrested, right? You haven't been convicted of anything. Um, but this is one of the main ways that people are sucked into the, the immigration courts is this interface between... Um, ICE and the local police. There's, there's a bunch of other um, connections. Uh, there's these task forces where local police officers work really closely uh, with ICE, with the Department of Homeland Security, with the FBI and other federal agencies that can enforce immigration law. Um, San Francisco had an agreement uh, with the FBI. I think it recently expired, right, the JTTF. Um, Oakland uh, currently has an agreement. Oakland just signed an agreement with ICE, even though um, Oakland is a sanctuary city. It's, it's sort of weird. It's controversial. Um, there'll be hearings about it. Um, I think tonight, actually, there are some hearings about it um, at a commission in Oakland. Um, but, sorry, this is a little confusing, but basically the idea here is that ICE is uh, it's a big law enforcement agency, but it's not that big. They can't actually, they don't have enough officers to actually go out and find all the people who are unlawfully present in the United States. So they rely on local law enforcement, which is really actually giant, um, to find those people for them. Um, and then people end up in the courts. So they get hit with a, it's called a notice to appear, and that person then has to appear in the court, or that person, um, say, they, say they were arrested or, or convicted of a, um, serious crime, ICE will actually then detain them and uh, put them in a jail. And in the Bay Area, one of those jails is the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Jail. They have a six million dollar a year contract with ICE to house people about 200 at any given time. Um, Yuba County, uh, there's a jail down here, Bakersfield. Um, so then you go to court. And the thing about the courts is the thing I'll, the thing the things I'll emphasize is um, it matters a lot where you end up in immigration court, meaning jurisdiction wise, you really want to go to court in San Francisco. You really don't want to go to court in Georgia. 
<laughs> because statistically speaking, if you go to court in San Francisco, all things being equal, your case will turn out a lot happier for you than if you end up in Georgia. Um, and there's a lot of other jurisdictions like that. I think um, some parts of the Midwest, other parts of the South, other parts of Texas, um, Arizona, they just have really bad courts. And then there's another level. You really don't want to end up before the wrong judge. It's almost arbitrary, but if you look at the statistics and case outcomes, the judges in immigration courts, the, the rulings that they come to, do, do I have a couple minutes? Yeah, keep going. Okay. I'm riveted. You're okay. riveted, right? You're, it, okay, yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back and just kind of explain how the, the, the court case works, right? So you get hit with a notice to appear um, as, a, as a person who the government says shouldn't be in America. You go to, you go to this court. Um, what the court's purpose is, there's like a two-step process, and this is the only thing the judge actually cares about. Are you removable? Like the judge wants to find out, are you removable? And if so, are you eligible for relief? It sounds very removable, relief, what's that all about? Um, but removable means, are you unlawfully present in the United States? And if you are, the government says you should be removed. There's, there's several ways to be removed. Deportation is one way, and it results in a deportation order. That's the harshest thing that can happen because then if you're deported, you can't come back to the United States for, I think it's, it's 10 or 20 years. 10 years. 10 years. And if you do, you can be put in prison for 20 years, right? Um, <clears throat> there's other forms of removal. You can like volunteer, you can self-remove, uh, self voluntarily deport yourself. If you do that, then you can actually try to come back at some future point much sooner, but it's still very difficult. Um, then there's these forms of relief that you can be eligible for. Now say, um, and then this is true for a lot of undocumented people. I mean, this is why a lot of people are undocumented. It's because they're running away from war, persecution. Um, so there's various forms of relief are, you know, asylum and um, hu humanitarian asylum, um, convention on torture. So if you, if, you, if you fear you will be tortured and if you can prove that to a court, if, that you'll be tortured if you're sent back to this country that you left, then you can be eligible for relief and you can stay in the United States. But the courts, but my, my summary of it is they're quite arbitrary and it matters a lot where you are and who your judge is. I haven't seen much change yet in my observations under the Trump administration in, in the immigration courts because it would be hard for Trump to make it more Kafka-esque and horrible. <laughs> Seriously, it already was terrible and, and it already was this, this, this like process whereby a person gets swept up into the system. What, what are, I mean, of the cases that you witnessed, I mean, what were, what were people typically arrested for? What were the, some of the outcome? Like, you can, you can come to the United States from just hypothetical, you know, yeah. Guatemala, 20 years ago, never arrested, hardworking, get married, have kids, get caught with marijuana, and you get deported, and you have no relief eligible because mm -hmm. Having marijuana is an aggravated felony under federal immigration law. And I've seen that. I saw that several times in, in cases I looked at. People were literally being deported for having weed. And it just seems so nuts, you know, given that like, it's totally mm -hmm. legal in California now. So wanna, I want to open it up to both, to, to the rest of the panel. Um, so SB, so we, Oakland and San Francisco are technically sanctuary cities. SB 54 is, you know, theoretically we'll make us, that what, is that, what does that actually mean in practice? Right, so that means um, there would be no help that uh, any local, local or state law enforcement, again, going down to school police, could give to um, uh, federal officials to detain, to arrest, or in other way assist uh, in immigration proceedings. Uh, and so it's interesting, though, um, as part of that, uh, 
there was originally an urgency clause attached to that measure, which, which is a two-thirds supermajority vote uh, in order to get that passed. And if an urgency clause or a two-thirds vote happens on a measure like this, it takes effect immediately, which is one reason why they were trying to fast track it. Well, uh, to get it through, and this sort of goes back to what you're saying about democratic unity, uh, to get it through, uh, De Leon made a number of amendments. One was to please the uh, Sheriff's Association across the state, which was opposed and I believe remains opposed to the bill, uh, which uh, would allow these task forces that you mentioned to continue it explicitly as their carve out for that. So local law enforcement would be allowed to participate in these uh, task forces that include ICE. Uh, and also they would be allowed no to notify ICE if they came into contact with someone who had been previously deported and had a violent, violent felony record. And so that would be one exception to the rule that it had. And even with those uh, changes, he changed, De Leon changed the measure to a simple majority vote. Now what that does is that means the measure, it, assuming it passes the assembly and is signed by the governor, would not take effect until January 1st. And so it doesn't really matter at what point during the legislative session this bill would pass at this point, given that the urgency clause has been removed. And that was done, um, presumably, given that there was a two-thirds vote uh, that, that occurred in the Senate, uh, all Democrats uh, voted for the bill um, this week. Presumably there was some holdouts in the assembly, uh, which again has, has uh, one above, one Democrat above what the supermajority would be there. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, you might see a recurring theme is I'm gonna give you guys the bad news. Uh, is that <laughs> you can set a lot of, you can set policy with regards to sanctuary city, but uh, it's gonna be very interesting if we do have sanctuary state and with each different, uh, their different iterations of sanctuary cities and cities across the state. Uh, I was talking to the immigration attorney, Bill Hing, who is, since I talked to him, he became a police commissioner, and he made it very clear that uh, you can have a sanctuary city policy, but quote, a maverick police officer who picks up the phone and calls ICE will be applauded by ICE and may be chastised by the mayor and the board of supervisors, but he won't be punished. It's quite a lot to say that, you know, that, that state and city law uh, would prevent someone from enforcing federal law. So if you have a random uh, ringer, police officer, or sheriff, he can undermine uh, the most carefully laid out sanctuary policy. And that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me jump in mm -hmm. on that point, too. Um, the, Supreme, the state Supreme Court uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, complained in her speech uh, last week that, hey, ICE, get out of our courtrooms. You know, we don't want um, your guys in our courtrooms taking people out. Uh, on, on so they were standing outside the court, the court they, they're standing outside the building and then detaining people, right? As that's they were what, yeah, that's what And the, then the, the judge had no power over that. Right. right. And so um, she said, you know, stop. I mean, they, we want people to feel safe when they go into court. And, and the response from uh, Sessions and, and Kelly wrote a letter back, or wrote a letter to her, then they made public, saying, listen, if you guys made, made our jobs easier for us, then we wouldn't have to, or didn't make our jobs so hard, which you guys are doing then we wouldn't have to resort to things like that. And so, you know, federal immigration law is federal immigration law. They're going to enforce it however they want in the ways that they want. The state can decide or cities can decide not to assist with that, but um, there are likely going to be consequences to that also that people are, are also not going to be comfortable with. We're, we're, we're succeeding right now in this and other cities because the feds are not competent. If they were competent, there are things they could do. Uh, <laughs> For example, in California, in this particular city, uh, in order to uh, get on Section 8 housing or other things like that, you need to be a citizen. If somebody's immigration status doesn't quite match up, it's funded out of the general fund. Could the feds su uh, track back that information and figure out who's being funded by the general fund and who isn't? They could. They could make things very difficult for us if they really wanted to put the screws to us. They haven't so far because, you know, I think, I think at this point in time, um, I think it's pretty clear that this is, these aren't supervillains here. You know, this is, this is being, it's, it's hard to run the government, let alone to run the government uh, in the vindictive way that many of us feared. And so far at least, you know, so far, we're only 60 odd, 70 days in, they have not yet been able to take advantage of all the things they could do, but they could do that. They're, they're, could they get the, the statistics for all of our municipal IDs, many of which are people who are getting municipal IDs because they can't get a driver's license or couldn't get a driver's license at the time it was issued? Yes, they could do that. So that, that could be a problem for us. There are just a few things I'd like to say while around the sanctuary cities point mm -hmm. uh, you know, that I've noticed in, in reading about this. You know, one is that you know, statewide polls show that actually a majority of Californians are opposed to the state becoming a sanctuary state. 
uh, which I think is important to keep in mind. Um, and the other factor that's going to be really interesting is Jerry Brown, you know, has said in the past that, you know, I mean, he, he's kind of played a two-faced game where on the one hand, he's, he's said, you know, very con confrontational things, you know, sort of rile up Trump, but he's also said, oh, well, we need to work with him and not necessar unnecessarily antagonize him. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, whether he signs this bill, assuming it does pass in the assembly. Um, so, you know, I think uh, that, you know, it's going to be also, uh, we're going to see debate, I think, more about, you know, are these policies effective? Um, and, you know, we, I did a story um, back during the Kate Steinle um, situation in San Francisco, you know, the woman who, who was killed and, you know, became sort of this right, this cause celeb on the right, for, you know, against sanctuary cities, you know, looking at San Francisco's policies. And, you know, there's quite a good case to be made that sanctuary cities are, in fact, safer. Um, you know, I compared San Francisco to other cities of similar size, you know, it's lower crime rates. Um, you know, since the sanctuary law was passed, crimes fell. Um, you know, there are police associations that support these laws. So, you know, I think all of that's going to come out more um, as this moves ahead. Um, one thing I'd love to, because both of you have done a lot of coverage of uh, local police departments, is, you know, when I've talked to, um, you know, nonprofits uh, in the city that work with the immigrant and Latino community, I mean, one of the difficulties here is just the lack of clear, um, you know, information about what ICE or is or isn't doing. Um, and so, like, when you talk to people who are setting up hotlines, they're getting rumors called in, or if they're setting up, you know, if they have lawyers on call, it's a whole big effort to figure out what's real or what's not real. Um, and then even when you talk to elected officials, they don't have good statistics on, you know, how widespread some of these, you know, reported raids are in the state of California. Um, what, I mean... How do you, I mean, how do you figure out, like, how do you as reporters, how can we figure out what they are or aren't doing here? And, like, how, what, how can local, you know, officials respond to that? It's, it's really hard to track ICE. Yeah. You know, because they're, as a federal agency, you can try to figure out if they had an operation last week. They don't have to tell you. You can FOIA their records. Good luck with that. Maybe eight months later, you'll get a letter back saying, "Here's some stuff," um, or "Here's you know, here's not some stuff. Go away." Um, there was a there was a spate of rumors. Like, when was that? A couple months ago. Richmond Costco. Richmond Costco, uh, Walmart Oakland, Foothill Oakland, um, Fruitvale. Lots of ice checkpoints everywhere, and people were freaking out. Um, Oakland Councilmember Abel Guillen uh, started contacting the Oakland Police Department um, Assistant Chief and saying, what's going on here? Is this true? Is ICE active in our community? Are there these checkpoints? And the Assistant Chief um, dispelled those rumors, but I remember this because e this, e this email chain got forwarded along to me. Um, and I remember this, uh, the Assistant Chief wrote, but ICE is here, they do operate in Oakland, and they do arrest people and pick people up, and we can't stop them from doing that, and they do have operations. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, I think the rumors are as damaging as the real thing in a way. They prevent people from going out to school or going out to... Yeah, it's, you know. it's, you know, it's, it's chilling. It, it prevents people from doing what they want to do, what they need to do to make a living, to send their kids to school, to associate. I mean, it's really, an, it, I don't know, arguably, it's, it's preventing people from associating with others and exercising free speech and just being out in public. I mean, your constitutional rights, you know, undocumented people have constitutional rights, too. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's, it's really chilling to see these rumors going around the Bay Area. It's frightening. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to move on to the other, the other major issue affecting California was the health care, um, AHDA. Um, and as you mentioned, I mean, to, to put it in context, like $24 billion, um, you know, in a hit to the California state budget, that's a half of what the state spends on K-12 education every year. It's, it's unfathomable. Um, so where are we now? And are we just, are we... Yeah. We're like, are we relieved that they're so incompetent that they couldn't get it through, or what? What? What is the potential that that could come back, or what? What are people doing to prepare on that? Sure. So, as far as the big number hit, um, not much. 
Um, but again, I think it's important, th th and because again, as you said, it's unfathomable. It's just you know, the argument has been, well, let's just not let's just not throw throw out all the cuts that we're going to make or scare people that they're going to get thrown off the healthcare rolls. You know, if if something passes, particularly when there's no actual plan to react against, right? Um, but there are you know, the details of all this stuff matters, and I wrote some I wrote some notes on this because it's it's kind of complicated. But essentially, you know, one area that that I think still scares people in the immediate term is uh, issues related to Planned Parenthood. Um, you know, if through uh, through so in the Republican plan, there was language in there that said uh, none of this money would be allowed to. Uh, go to or none of these tax credits, which were to re replace uh, what the Medicaid subsidies uh, were going to be, could go towards plans that covered uh, abortions, right? And so it just so happens that in California, uh, under state law, essentially every plan is mandated to cover cover abortions, right? And so what was going to happen? Uh, no one really knew, and that was going to be a big, big problem. Um, you know, as part of that, uh, Kevin McCarthy, who is from California, is high ranking within the GOP caucus uh, in Congress um, has asked uh, Tom Price, the HSS secretary, to go through and see if they could undo uh, an Obama-era rule that was rolled out when, uh, when Obamacare was passed um, that dealt with this issue. Basically, Obama's saying this was not a problem, right? So McCarthy's asked for a review of that of that rule, um, and or if you go through the budget um, process where Planned, Parent, Planned Parenthood is defunded uh, and, and, and that passes, that would sort of address the same thing. And the state would not then be directly, well, it would be directly, essentially directly funding uh, Planned Parenthood through deciding whether to spend probably a few hundred million dollars to backfill some of the Medi-Cal recipients who would be not eligible for services. And so. Mm -hmm you know, exactly how those details are worked out and whatever bill there is or whatever budget resolution there is or whatever plan there is really matter to how the state's going to have to react to this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, there was also, um, sh also shifting to another area, um, earlier this week um, there was an, some guidance or an order from Jeff Sessions at the DOJ about reviewing all of the various um, you know, police agreements and consent degrees that were happening with, you know, PDs around the country. Um, you know, Darwin, you broke a huge story about the OPD last year. What do you think, what do you think that does to accountability for police officers in the East Bay? It then, doesn't, yeah. yeah, it doesn't affect Oakland's consent decree because yeah. Oakland's is actually a negotiated settlement agreement. <clears throat> it's a totally unique um, police reform oversight mechanism because it wasn't brought by the Justice Department. It was brought by plaintiffs' uh, attorneys representing over 100 African American men who had been um, who had had their rights violated by the the rioters back in the 2000s. So Jeff Sessions can't remove the negotiated settlement agreement that is <laughs> trying to force the Oakland Police Department to reform itself. But yeah, virtually every other consent decree over a police department for reform. Could you give some context on what that is, how that works, just so for the audience? Yeah. Um, when, when you can prove that there is what's called a pattern and practice of um, civil rights violations or other really severe problems in a police department, right, it's not just like one or two bad apples kind of thing, but that there's deeply um, structural problems in a police department. Um, the federal government will come in and take the, essentially take the police, almost take the police department over all but, and say you have to institute these reforms or we'll simply appoint um, a special receiver and they'll force you to do these things. And that would be like the nuclear option because then the city would lose its um, budgetary authority over its police department. But consent decrees are how America cleans up its police forces. The DOJ comes in um, enters a consent decree with the local police department. A couple years go by, things are supposed to get cleaned up. Um, Jeff Sessions could un undo all that. He, he could cancel those, uh, and he, he has said he wants to, uh, th those sorts of uh, uh, reform measures. Well, the good news for you here in San Francisco is all of those things were non-binding anyway. So uh, we, there, were, there was nothing to be held to other than the fact that the mayor said he wanted it, and I'm sure that was a precondition of hiring Chief Scott, uh, was that they wanted to do all these things. 
Uh, on an individual level, though, I think it's pretty obvious that a message is being sent. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't run to print with it, and we're being videoed here, but, you know, I've, I've heard rumors about cops uh, talking in the locker room about, like, now, now I can do what I want, you know, and that happens. That happens even here in San Francisco. And so, so definitely that message was being sent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to, we will get to audience questions, so you can, but we have uh, just, I want to touch on two, two more topics. Um, so, because there's so many that are affected by this administration. Um, so climate change is um, a big point of disagreement uh, between the state of California and, and the federal administration. And there were two areas, kind of the primary areas I think that you mentioned, Liam, were the Clean Air Act waiver and then vehicle emissions. Could you talk about what the differences are in policies that states as what our leverage is? Sure, so the, the Clean Air Act waiver is, to, is for, uh, yeah. for us to enforce or be able to enforce stricter vehicle yeah. emission standards than we would okay, have otherwise. Right, there was another area that um, they just roll, rolled back uh, recently called the Clean Power Plan. Yeah. Um, and so what that was were Obama era regulations in terms of phasing out coal and other sort of energy sources like that to, and, and, and spurring renewable energy sources, solar, wind, et cetera, right? And so the thing, the, there was a lot of bluster from California about how bad that is, right? Um, but we were already on track under state legislation to meet the standards uh, far beyond um, what the federal regulations were. So they were, they were mainly aimed at, those federal regulations that were just rolled back were mainly aimed at states that were not as far as California in terms of addressing renewable energy sources. In fact, we were mandated to believe, uh, yeah, half of our energy must be from renewable sources by 2030 under current law, and there's a new proposal to push that to 100% by 2045. So again, well ahead of what the rollback of the uh, clean power plan would be. The serious one is this vehicle emissions uh, issue, which is, again, we have this waiver that we're allowed to have stricter standards, and the number one source of uh, greenhouse gas pollution um, is from cars and trucks, right? And so that's why there's this major push to get um, uh, electric cars on the road uh, at an extremely fast rate. That's why there's even a push to have greater densities within urban areas to keep people or have people to drive less to work. Um, that's all along the lines of meeting, getting people off the road so that um, uh, uh, those pollution stand, those pollution um, uh, emissions don't contribute to our greenhouse gas um, problem. And so that's where the Trump administration ultimately could. Uh, really play a large role. That's, again, more of a long-term thing. The existing waiver we have now, most people think we can't, that, that they can't touch. But as we apply, maybe five years, maybe 10 years down the road for an additional um, waiver, that's where some of the concern might come in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so one of the last areas I just want to touch on before you open up to general questions um, is around um, affordable housing. Um, you know, a lot of low-income housing and uh, the Bay Area is funded through low-income housing tax credits, and you know, with the expectation of um, corporate tax reform, what's happened with a lot of different projects, both in San Francisco and the South Bay, and I'm less clear about the East Bay, um, is that you know the financiers who normally buy these credits in order to finance low-income housing now think that they'll be worth like much less on the dollar um, because they think that corporations won't be interested in buying these tax credits because they'll get their taxes cut. And so that is jeopardized, that has jeopardized some of the financing for different projects in the Bay Area. And that in turn affects the affordable housing bond money that Santa Clara County and Alameda County, um, you know, raised. It was 580 million in Alameda County and then almost a billion in Santa Clara County. So that money, if this tension continues into this corporate tax reform period, or this tax reform period where you're supposed to change that this year, um, that's going to mean all the money that we asked voters to pay for um, is not going to go as far um, as was originally anticipated. So I was just wondering if you, I know you cover housing policy, um, if you're seeing that on the ground at all. This is, this is, this is more your area than Yeah, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I can speak a little yeah, bit. Sure. I, mean, I know that there are, there, and this is another area which is really interesting because Trump and the Congress didn't actually do anything yet, right? Yeah. They've just said, hey, we want to cut corporate tax rates, and that, you know, spooked investors in these, in these programs. And so who knows what the corporate tax rates ultimately going to be? Who knows if they can 
pull something like that off, right? Um, given their track record so far, I mean, who knows, right? <laughs> so, so, but even with just the threat of action or the talk that they're doing, they're real on the ground impacts. I mean, there was mm -hmm. multi-million dollar funding gaps and projects in you know, the Bay Area better yeah. than me, but multi-million multi dollar uh, funding gaps already because of this in projects in San Diego and in Los Angeles. Um, and so people are very, very worried. When I talked to an expert in, in this area, he told me that it's, this is a, you know, the state's largest source of, of uh, affordable housing money is this program. And this is the equivalent of a, of a uh, 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 quarter billion dollar hit to that program. We, again, without anything actually happening, that's the reality uh, if, the, if investors are only willing to pay significantly less for, for these credits. And so mm -hmm. and at, at a time when state funding for low-income housing is, continues to drop, this is sort of another kick in the teeth. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's also worth pointing out that a quarter of a billion dollars buys you one eighth of the Raiders at this point in time. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, I mean, <laughs> for, for the state, that's not. I mean, I mean, God help us, but for the state, that's not a lot of money. You know, in this case, you're with the with the needs that we have. This doesn't help. We were already in a bad spot, as I mentioned in in, in my overlong preamble. You know, uh, we lost a lot when redevelopment was curtailed. At least the, the modern iteration of redevelopment, not mm -hmm. the the film or destroying iteration of redevelopment. And, uh, and, and again, this would have happened under any Republican administration. And uh, uh, all of the housing plans that we're going forward with now are, are, are kind of grasping at, at crumbs here. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> Let me briefly bring together the affordable housing conversation and the immigration um, Im uh, conversation. There is an interesting story in City Lab that I think just came out today that was saying that landlords are increasingly using eviction threats, mm -hmm. um, are, are increasingly using deportation threats to evict tenants. Um, so, you know, they're saying we're going to call ICE on you unless, you know, you move out. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of this perfect storm in that regard, you know, for, for disadvantaged people, um, hit both with a loss of affordable mm -hmm. housing and a loss of tenant rights. Hmm. Um, so last question, any or all of you can jump on if you want. I think I asked you a variation of this question when you were on the phone, and I was like, where, you know, with the sources that you talk to in your level, you know, in the level of government that you cover, I mean, where are they on the, um, we are sliding towards authoritarian kleptocracy spectrum to the, oh, this administration is, you know, incompetent slash the machinery and the slowness of American government is doing what it has always done to people who are elected into power, where would you characterize your assessment of uh, you know, the administration's far and then the level of government you cover and how it's reacted to it? I don't think people in government are as amazed as you are at what we're seeing in the news. Uh, and and you know, I think all of us have, have, have mentioned an iteration of what we could call blue meat for, the, uh, for, for California. I think that, I think you've all mentioned, I think everyone on the panel has mentioned that it politically behooves people here to be seen as against this uh, administration, regardless of what uh, the uh, retribution would be, uh, because uh, that is what appeals to voters here. And, uh, and, you know, I think, you know, for marginally popular Democratic mayors like Ed Lee or more, much more so Bill de Blasio, this is, this is, I mean, they, you know, Trump may eviscerate New York, but Bill de Blasio is probably going to get reelected in the landslide now. I don't even know if he's going to get a competent person running against him. As far as your question as to what they think is going on, uh, something that's, that, that's going to be more and more of a problem for actually running San Francisco and running other cities is that there aren't people in seats in government right now. It's going to be hard to do the things you need to do to get the, the, the checks signed, to get things happening when they aren't filling the damn positions. And the people they are filling them with are astoundingly unfit and incompetent, you know, from the World Net Daily guy and other things like that. So if, you know, if you filled one-tenth of the positions, the people you fill it with are, you know, on par with, you know, just, just folks you'd pull out of the bus or, you know, you know try, and, try and get to go to, like, you know, a show in Los Angeles to watch Colin Ferguson. You know I mean? It's like, it's, you, know, you want to watch a show? You know, you, you, you want to work in health and human services? You know, it's that kind of thing. So sooner or later, that's going to have an effect, you know, and, and it's going to be harder and harder for us to do things. But I'd say, you know, you know knock on wood again, it's very preliminary. We, the, the shots haven't been fired yet, but San Francisco and, and other big cities have a little bit more leverage than we thought because things run so poorly in Washington right now, we have more leverage than we thought because the Senate is important and you know, we do have ranking members there. Mm -hmm. So we're doing better than we ought to be so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in. I mean, we're, it's, 
remarkable how much people vacillate between those two extremes in almost the same breath. I mean, you, you have the Speaker of the Assembly, um, also from LA, Anthony uh, Rendon, who is actually not given to hyperbole very often. He's much more low-key than, than Kevin DeLeon is. And he has said repeatedly that he is worried at whether there will be even be elections in 2018. I mean, he's said this repeatedly. And again, this is not a guy who says these sorts of things all the time, right? At the same time, I mean, when the health care bill failed, man, you could hear the cackles. Like, at my office across the street, you could hear the cackles in the Capitol <laughs> from, like, these jokers can't do anything, right? I mean, they've been waiting eight years. They can't do a freaking thing. And so, like, it's just this it's extreme vacillation between the world is going to end and these guys are so incompetent they can't do anything. And that's where everyone seems to... There's no real middle there. It's, everyone seems in, to be... In, in foreign affairs, yeah. incompetence can lead to the world ending. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. so, so the authoritarian kleptocracy beat is actually something I've, I've covered quite a bit. Um, <laughs> oh, great. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, I, I spend a fair amount of time um, uh, having beers with this guy named Curtis Yarvin. Um, who, oh, wow. Who is... Uh, Whoa. Oh, I know who Curtis Yarvin who is. Who is the inventor of an ideology known as neo-reaction, otherwise known as the dark enlightenment. And he is probably um, America's preeminent uh, anti-democratic activist or thinker, probably more of a thinker than an activist. But and he lives in San Francisco. He lives in San Francisco, works in tech. Uh, I did a story about alt tech, um, and uh, I quoted him in that and, and some other things I've written. But you know, he's actually, I mean, his whole thing is, you know, we need an authoritarian ruler. You know, he, he's sort of a neo-monarchist. Um, yeah, but within more of a sort of Peter Thiel technocratic way, um, you know, he wants like a CEO, CEO president. And Trump would seemingly be like, you know, the perfect guy for that, right? He's a CEO, he's a president. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but he actually was, was quite unimpressed with Trump. Um, you know, he thought he was sort of like a poor uh, shadow of, of Hitler or Mussolini. Um, and, uh, you know, really the, the thing is, though, that, I mean, I think he's right on some level in that, you know, a true authoritarian is somebody who is popular. Like you can't have like a 35% approval rating and also be an effective authoritarian. And Trump appeals to a certain nativist base, but he really doesn't have the elites on his side yet in a way that, you know, is it, it, going to give him legs as an authoritarian. Like, uh, now, as to whether he's a kleptocrat, that's a different question. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, you know, the lack of his tax returns, you know, all of the, the, the shady business dealings uh, and ways that he could potentially um, benefit from the presidency financially uh, leave a lot of open questions there. Uh, and, you know, we're not going to know how bad it is until we know. Um, but, you know, things aren't looking good. Okay, so let's open up to the audience. All right, so once again, we'll take questions, not comments. And we, yes, we're in a brave new world, folks. Here we go. Uh, great. Um, uh, th thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, great uh, discussion, uh, guys and gal. Um, if the audience will... Oh, hey, Chris. <laughs> um, I know that guy. <laughs> if you'll forgive uh, going away from Trump and then maybe coming so back for a second. Stick around. Stick around. It's, it's, so it's, so it's, it's, I think, yeah. is it Joe in the, in the city t-shirt? I'm Joe. I apologize if you have your name uh, mm -hmm. wrong. Um, the $1.2 billion that is at stake with the sanctuary issue, that's... That's, that's like recurring funds. That's, recurring that's, funds. That's every year you get that money in your budget. So, so what percentage of the budget, roughly, would that be? One point two billion out of nine point six billion. Okay, that's pretty. What is that thirteen yeah, percent? Okay. So, um, I guess mm -hmm. the right. The, the question is, uh, in a city like this, with Uber and Twitter and Airbnb and Salesforce and what looks to be like an ocean of money flowing through the city, uh, to someone untutored like me, how can it possibly be? that budgets are as tight as they seem to be. Um, and that's my question. Thank you very much. I think, I think the quick answer is more money, more problems. You know, uh, we are, we've never pulled in more money from the assessor's office. And by the way, like people forget, the assessor's office, you know, uh, Carmen Chu quietly doing, you know, very competent, that pulls in like 40% of your general fund. So you're bringing in that money. Don't forget though, we have 4,000 more city employees than we did four years ago. And uh, our pension obligation would have, would have put us deeply in the hole, regardless of uh, whether uh, Trump was president or, or if we reanimated federal uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So, I mean, I think, you know, not to be too flip about it, but there's the old expression of work expands to meet time. Or, so, also, when you have lots of money, you tend to put it into things. You know, very rarely do cities, you know, with people with needs, say, we're just going to sit on this money. We do have rainy day funds. Uh, you can thank Tom Amiano for that. 
but they're at eight and a half percent. You're supposed to be 10 percent. And even still, if we get any kinds of cuts of the sort that you know the Feds are threatening, that's that's a child's experiment. So you know we we are dealing with huger budgets, and I can you know I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly, but. Part of that is that we don't have redevelopment anymore. The city is actually paying for a lot of this stuff as opposed to it coming from the state. That's why the budget now is literally twice what it was. The general fund is $5 billion now as opposed to uh, 2.6 or something like that in 2007. That's doubling. That's, that's incredible. But uh, are, are we twice as well governed? No. But, uh, you know, I can go, it's, it's a separate discussion in and of itself. Uh, suffice to say, all of the extra money that we're making through private uh, industry is, is not going into uh, the money bin. And a lot of it is going to pay for things that were deferred. Um, so so that's, that's a partial answer to the question. We're, we're not in the surplus now, and, uh, and it looks like we'll have uh, some belt tightening in the next few years, regardless of what happens. To the extent that we're not a monolithic state or city, even though we're very democratic, <coughs> and to the extent that Democrats have been characterized as being mainly for immigrants, uh, illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants, and to the extent that we're characterized as being for uh, bathrooms for transgender people, and that's our big issue. What can we do, since it's so easy to um, grandstand about Trump, what can we do to get Democrats to address other issues? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, you know, I think that it's not about addressing, I mean, I think your, your question is not so much that these things aren't important, but that you want the other issues to be addressed. I mean, I, I guess I need to know like, what other issues you think are important. Are we talking more about economic issues, um, for instance, or, you know, what? Yeah, I mean, I think there are um, important economic issues that are getting ignored in the hysteria um, that surrounds a lot of these other hot-button political issues. Um, yeah, I think that would be one example of it. I mean, the infrastructure thing is not a sexy um, subject. Um, you know, it's gotten, it's been covered pretty well by the LA Times and you know, other California papers, I think, but that's hugely important to the state. Um, but, uh, you know, unless you peg it to Trump, um, the page views on those stories, uh, which we see, we all see, are going to be way lower. Um, so, uh, you know, on, this is sort of what, you know, Bernie Sanders was saying during his primary, you know, trying to get people to run for local offices. I think, uh, you know, part of that is also just appreciating the nuts and bolts of politics, you know. And I think, though, that, you know, you look at that, that election that just happened to replace Javier Pricera, um in um, Southern California, the like open congressional seat. Turnout was incredibly low. What um, was the turnout last night? I don't know, Yesterday? was it like 9% or something like that? Uh, 12. It, it, it was yeah. a little higher, but also it'll, it'll roll in and be, but yeah. it's certainly below 20. There was, like, there was the mayoral yeah. election, and that was 11%. That went up to about 20 once all okay, the ballots so were counted. Okay, so it's 21, okay. Yeah. But they all, yeah, that's about where things are. Yeah, okay. and the Sanders candidates last, I don't think the returns were in yet. You know, there are two candidates who are serving the Sanders camp, each got like 5%, right. which is, you know, terrible. Um, and so, you know, where's the grassroots activism? You know, I mean, he's the, the candidate who, you know, has this, his whole message is supposed to be about the economics, you know, um, but there, there's not, you know, a ground game yet. And maybe it's just because those, those guys are young. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, there's a disjoint between how much everybody says they care about Trump and how much people are actually involved in the dirty and boring work of politics. Mm -hmm. In the back. Thank you very much for being here. So I have a perhaps maybe like a really naive question, um, but the broader question is what is what do you what is your opinion on the role or the balance between the markets and policy? And I'll give you two examples where I think that really plays out. So you guys were talking a little bit about the Clean Air Act and how California's you know several decades ahead of the game on climate change policies, um, whereas the rest of the country is lagging. And in the past couple of months. Trump has you know, said all of these things on Twitter and elsewhere about how he's planning to dismantle um, climate change progress. And yet, two days ago, we just saw that Tesla Motors just surpassed Ford, which has been literally there 100 years apart in their founding. Ford was founded in 1903, Tesla in 2003. 
um, Tesla has surpassed Ford in valuation, um, even though they're like selling fewer cars and all that stuff. Um, and so, just curious, what you guys, what you guys think about that, and what's the role of the private sector in driving some of these kind of like policy-related um, initiatives? Uber is also another big one that's driving kind of like on-demand labor, which could affect immigration, um, prison policy, and things like that. And yeah, how much of it is policy? How much of it is just capital markets? You know, I wrote a, a long story about Tesla um, a few years ago. Um, about the uh, irony, it was sort of the, the central premise um, was that there was an irony that Elon Musk um, succeeded at Tesla through um, subsidies, federal subsidies, yet he claims, I mean, he's basically a libertarian, you know, he's, he's friends with Peter Thiel, you know, he's part of that whole like PayPal mafia group, um, you know, he's constantly talking about libertarian stuff. And he actually tweeted at one point that he was against subsidies, um, but in favor of a carbon tax. Um, and so the story was about actually how, no, you, you do need subsidies for, for a company like Tesla to succeed. Um, but I think your, your point, though, is that you, know, you, you need a Tesla um, to be out there at least advocating on some level for um, policies that are going to move us in the right direction. Uh, and sometimes you know, they, they do a good job of that, and other times they don't. Um, but you know, I do think, though, that you know, looking at the big three automakers and... Um, the, there's just the incredible hypocrisy of how they um, have done a 180 degree about face and are now lobbying Trump to do away with you know, mile, for fuel efficiency rules that, that were put in place right after taxpayers bailed them out during the depths of the recession and the Obama administration went to bat for them. Uh, you know, it's just a huge stab in the back, um, really, for, for so many people who supported them. And so I think that it sort of like actually shows the weakness of their business model, ultimately. I mean, you know, they've staked their fortune on selling SUVs, again, now that gas is cheap, um, but is that a good long-term strategy? It seems like they're, they're real, they're only, they have such a short-term view of profit. Um, and, you know, what I have to give Tesla credit for is looking at profit from a long-term. Uh, and ultimately, you know, shareholders have rewarded him for that. If we could govern the same way that, that Elon uh, governs Tesla, we, we might be in better shape. Not that I want to see you a president, though. <laughs> Another question here in the back. Thank you for being here. I was a little bit concerned by multiple comments that there's no backup plan if federal funding is withdrawn because it's just such a big problem that we're too afraid to even think about it. And I was curious if anyone was thinking about a backup plan. Is there at a citywide level in San Francisco thoughts about increasing an income tax? And maybe to this gentleman's question about there seems to be a lot of money in the state. And have you well, heard anything about... Yes, yeah. yes. Well, first of all, that's, that's, that's not a capitulation. Uh, I think that they also think that the chance of losing all of the money is extremely remote. I think that uh, when folks in the city's legal apparatus tell me that the quality of lawyership and, uh, and draftsmanship on the executive order is poor, uh, you and I might use other words. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you read the city attorney's brief, but uh, winning on any one of many points would, uh, would, would preserve the city's status quo for now. And there were many points, and the arguments were very good. So I think that they think that they've got a really good go at that. As far as undermining health care, that's different. You can't recover from losing 92% of your health and human services funds. You cannot do it, you know? So uh, it's something to almost not plan for. You know, you have to, you have to be proactive and, 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 again, stave off that eventuality. Uh, what was the second part of your question? There are, but the thing is that the, that's problematic about the, the millionaires tax is that millionaires can move to Marin, you know, and uh, I believe that um, several of the other plans, uh, confidentially, were uh, the city attorney told them weren't legal. Uh, so it, it's uh, Phil Ting's plan to, uh, to allow cities to have city taxes here in California again. I don't know. It seems like a surefire loser to me. I mean, very few people want to come out and say, I want to have more taxes. You know, I mean, am I going to then get more when I pay more money? That's how most people think. Most San Franciscans are paying a premium to live here. They don't want to pay more to the city that they don't trust to administer the funds very well. So uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I raised my eyebrows when I saw Katie Tang supported it, who is Phil's constituent. But, uh, but you know, that, that seems like a loser to me.
I think some context there to add is like in the state of California, there have been so many propositions that have been passed over the last 40 years that restrain the ability of governments to raise funding unless you have like a two thirds majority vote. And so taxes are really part because you need the super majority. And then on top of that, like cities can't charge individual income tax here. That's the, the, pro that's the area of the state. And you'd have to change state law in order to charge income tax here. They're working on that, but I, I don't see it happening. I think Jerry Brown would veto it, and I think here in the city it would it would not fly under under Mayor Lee. Can I kind of say something really quickly? Um, so it's interesting, sort of how complex all this interplay is going to be. So, say for instance, they achieve their goals on health care and corporate tax reform. Okay. Well, in that circumstance, um, it, whatever the deal on corporate tax reform, I, I will bet all the money I have that some group in California will run a ballot measure to recapture all the gains that high income earners got um, from a lower federal tax. And given California's recent history in wanting to soak the rich on a statewide level, um, it would be surprising to me if that, if like that didn't pass. And so could you argue that that money would go towards backfilling Medi-Cal? I'm sure you could. Um, and so how all these things ultimately end up on so many different levels, it's, they're just going to be that the way the, this interplay. But um, yeah. we've got a question just, in the back. Well, so oh, he wanted to answer really quickly. Because you've got a bunch of political reporters up here, I think the answers are really wonky. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if, if you had catastrophic cuts at that level where literally healthcare services are being just taken away, um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see you know, the legislature or the, you know, the controller or the mayor uh, being the people who have the relevant backup plan. People would be in the streets. There would be, there would be serious social disruption, I would think. Mm -hmm. that, that would just be my guess as to what would happen. But, I mean, if you're talking about gutting, you know, Medicare and Medicaid, it I just don't see yeah. the American it people. It, it depends. That's the people cool. that are hurt uh, are oftentimes, I mean, San Francisco is, is, like I said, a very bifurcated city. And, you know, an awful lot of terrible things happen to, to poor people at General Hospital every day. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it will test everyone's ability to be inured to human pain if that happens. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I've been surprised at, at, at how pliant we've been about many things. We even allowed them to kill Halloween in the Castro. So yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I mean, I think when, like I mean, in the, if you look at the Reagan administration when it came into power, I mean, homelessness was not a wide, it was not like a very visible mm -hmm. issue in the media or in the streets of American cities until literally the early 1980s, and then there was a lot of changes to low-income housing policy and anti-poverty policy, and lo and behold, lots of homeless people started appearing in San Francisco. And now people believe that it's a permanent phenomenon, but it wasn't a permanent phenomenon in the history of the city. It's a structural problem that came about as a result of that interplay between local and federal and state policies. And um, no one structurally did anything about it. So, you, I, mean, like, I mean, people did, but like, it, hasn't, it obviously has mostly kept it at the kind of same level for the last you know, generation. Um, but now it's become a feature of the city that just wasn't there before. So it's possible, like, if the Trump administration fundamentally changed policies in a way, you would see a new structural problem emerge. And if people learn to normalize that, then it would become a thing that would become normalized for the next generation of Californians. So this question is about the alt-right. Um, I specifically was curious about Josh from Mother Jones' thoughts on this. I, from my perspective, I've, I've been involved in campaigns, and I see Donald Trump as doing a really good job at locking down the vote in 2020, maybe even 2018, with trying to stop, trying to at least frame things to those swing states, trying to frame it as if he's not going to be moving, as if he's stopping jobs from going to places like Mexico. On the other hand, I see deportation and a lot of key states like Arizona, Florida, where there's a Latino supermajority, it seems like it's going to compromise those votes. So I'm wondering, in terms of just campaign strategy here in San Francisco, and also as a Democrat, I don't want to see that happen, but I think sometimes we can be insular. From what you've seen, what do you think the odds are, uh, based on the media, based on what Latinos are, are seeing in those swing states, that that Republicans will win in both 2018 and 2020? So you mean winning on some kind of nativist, um, anti-immigrant um, 
upswing in, in voters, you know, in the same way Trump won this, this time around. Um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think uh, it's, it's going a lar- to a large degree depend upon a lot of things that happen between now and then. Um, I mean, you know, there's an argument that a lot of this nativism is in, at root sort of economically motivated. Um, because people tend to focus more on their inherent identity than their achieved identity, um, you know, their success in their careers um, when times are hard. Um, and, you know, if, if the economy approves, um, you know, that sentiment might diminish. Of course, that would also bolster Trump uh, for, in other ways. Um, but I think Democrats also just have to make a case, um, you know, that this is, this is wrong um, and they need to, to organize their, uh, their diverse base. Um, uh, to, to vote, um, you know, in two years from now. So, you know, if they do that, um, then, you know, I mean, it was a, a pretty close election. Um, you know, I think they could win uh, even if, um, you know, uh, the xenophobia and nativism uh, strains of, of, of the Trump coalition uh, remain strong. Okay. Question here? We'll have yeah, three more questions. Qu- oh, okay. Um, what are your thoughts on the positive and negative role of social media and what comes before us in the state and local levels? You mean how social media relates to the local budgets or just social media in general? How things come up. Um, deserve to, okay. Um, Wait, I'm confused with the second part of the question. Social. Positive and negative role, uh, positive, thoughts about positive and negative role of social media. Okay. What comes up for us Okay. Yeah. Sure. I think it's almost entirely negative. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I spend too much time on Twitter, and it's it's all wasted time. And I know I'll look back at some time in the future that my son's much bigger, and I'm not healthy, etc. And I'll think that nah, I wasted a shit ton of time. And I think what's worse is that it's there's an incredible opportunity for malevolent behavior, and uh, and it's been weaponized, and it didn't take much. Uh, so I. I I don't think there's ever a halcyon day of American politics. You know, I don't think that there was ever a good old days. There's always been something wrong. Uh, but I would say that social media allows really wretched behavior on a widespread level. And if you're an awful person and you're just the, uh, the awful person that, that your friends and family have to deal with, and now you can annoy people in Kansas and Canada and across the round, and you know, so you can, it, it can be, it can be, it can be a truly wretched development and you know it's something that has to be dealt with now because uh, people uh, more than ever are, are deciding um, you're coming in on an even par with uh, with uh, genuinely dishonest people and partisans uh, when you're uh, a disinterested newspaper reporter with disinterested you know is a much mistaken word it means means you're, you're uh, on the level so that that's very difficult you know uh, it's very very difficult I, I would say that it's mostly bad. Mm-hmm. We have a question from Facebook. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> nice. Yeah. There you go. Off now. Yeah, great. Mm-hmm. All right. Trump's proposing eliminating NEA and NEH. What impact do you think this would have on California? I don't know our, do you know our well, I'd, I'd say here? it's much worse elsewhere. I'd say it's much worse in, the, in, in, in places that are, that are more removed I'd say that uh, far from being a, a thing for coastal elites, um, uh, oftentimes uh, these federal funds uh, carry with them matching state funds. And this is how you get art troops in the Midwest, and this is how you get uh, this sort of thing around the country. So it, it's, it's damaging to the people that voted for Trump in mass. In California, you're going to be all right. You know, you're going to find things to do if you are uh, lucky enough to have leisure time to find artistic endeavors. They will be here in this part of the country. They may not be when you get to other places, and now there'll be fewer of them. Mm-hmm. That's true, but we, we did a, my, my paper did a uh-huh. story on that a couple weeks back. And uh, yeah, I think we found a, a dozen or so East Bay Arts nonprofits that would lose the majority of their budget if, if NEA funding is pulled. Last question. Okay, last question here. I was curious, you were talking about a lot of tough talk at the state and, and city level uh, against Trump, and I was wondering how soft or how hard is that resistance once the federal dollars start to dry up on, on issues like immigration or climate? Will it just evaporate, that resistance, will they, or will they hold the line? 
Uh, I can speak from the stage perspective. I, I think, again, that's context dependent. If there's one thing that Jerry Brown, well, there's two things Jerry Brown cares about. One is nuclear war. The other is climate change. And so it, if there are um, actions on climate change that threaten that, you're going to see a very, very, very strong reaction from, from him on that. With respect to immigration, Kevin DeLeon, I mean, that's his, 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 the primary issue that he's been going at. And so I think, you know, it, it, it is context dependent. Um, and I think there, it's interesting that different leaders within the state have sort of different kind of red line standards of things that they don't want to see crossed. So I think it will, it will be firm on those issues that are very important to the, the people who are most in power. Yeah. And I want to end on a positive note with relation to that. I mean, one of the more poetic things about the Californian resistance is, you know, a generation ago, the state passed Prop 187 to withhold public services from um, undocumented immigrants. And now, you know, 20 some odd years later, the leadership of the California state legislature are all Latinos. Um, and they've come into power in part because of the reaction to, you know, th that, that anti-immigrant legislation a generation ago. So anyway, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, we're gonna talk about the second break. Thank you, Kim and panelists. And also, if you would like to be inspired, Come and join us for a program with our California Poet Laureate, Dana Joya, who was head of the NEA, and you can continue that conversation with him when he's here on April 19th. Uh -huh. Thank you. And then after this, we're to the Dada Bar, right? Yeah. Downstairs Dada Bar. <laughs>